Oh. That's a big drift up there. Oh, come on, sweetheart. Let's make it through it. Come on. Oh, goodness. Well, that's just not even going to work. Let's tie it down. Wow. One car, one big drift. A beautiful, beautiful locomotive here. The 818C in all of its glory, but uh, trying to push its way through the drifts. Uh, that's apparently not going to be a thing, so I, I guess we're going to have to uh, come back to this whole situation here, and uh, we'll get back to this as well, and maybe some of those other things that we've seen. <laughs> What's up, guys? This is Mark, and yes, uh, welcome to the March devlog for patrons over on Patreon, April for all the rest of you out there on YouTube, uh, although I will note that this is April uh, for patrons as well. Thank you so much for bearing with us uh, at, at, on my time uh, right now that this is being recorded at just after midnight uh, on April 1st. So April Fools, it's March 32nd. Uh, we we'll hope you... <laughs> Uh, can live with our uh, our slightly delayed delivery here. We had all sorts of fun things and holidays and travel. And, but anyways, let's get into the vlog and kind of do a round robin and see what's been going on this month. For the eagle-eyed among you watching the intro of this video, you might have noticed something pretty cool going on with the couplers. And we did spotlight couplers and air brakes last month, but we really didn't give couplers the proper time of day. Jake did a ton of work to get a really cool draft gear and coupler simulation put together for last month. But this month, he's actually gone even further and done even more neat things among coupler space. So, Jake, uh, what's been going on this month as far as couplers go? Yeah, so I have been doing quite a bit of work. Um, couplers, they worked for the last devlog, but they were still pretty rudimentary. Um, one thing that they did that I didn't particularly like and that some sharp-eyed people probably caught up on um, was that when you pulled one cut lever, both knuckles opened. That was one thing that I addressed. And now they just, they function a lot more like you would expect a real knuckle coupler to. There's a lot more you can do to interact with them. So like Mark, if you actually go click on that open knuckle right there, <laughs> you see, you can, you can push it shut like you might want to. But now if you click it again, like you're going to try and pull on it, no, nothing <laughs> happens because... You can't yank on a locked knuckle like that and expect it to open. You got to hit the cut lever. Right, exactly. It's all through the guts there. Yeah. Yeah. And I also, I revamped some of the animations and now they're just like so satisfying. Yeah, it's, that's quite nice. We like that. But now, why don't you go ahead and pop that knuckle open? Okay. Oh, sorry. Can't do that. That way. <laughs> and now, so in real life, what would you expect to happen if you backed this locomotive into this, uh, car that has Lincoln pin on it. What do you think would happen? Uh, the knuckle would close, and then you would be kicking a car, basically, so maybe we'd do a little of that. <laughs> okay. And, uh, why don't you pull up the the other cool thing that we're going to talk about later? Ah, uh, yes. We're going to show now. Uh, we're going to we're going to show this now, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it later, um, in depth. So little little spoilers for now. A little bit of fun driving UI stuff. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Just just give it a bonk. Gentle little bump, sweetheart. Bang. <laughs> and look, it, it closed the knuckle. And you got the draft gear and everything. Oh my yep. goodness, that's awesome. Now, click click on that Lincoln pin coupler. Wonder what's going to happen. There. Oh, well, how about that? You'll love to see that. And we got the brake tied, so it's holding it that down nice and fast. I was yeah, that's that is something I was so looking forward to getting to work. That is just absolutely brilliant. Seeing split knuckles and link and pin actually getting married and actually doing the thing here. That's really cool. Yeah, I can only imagine the amount of work that that was. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a lot of work, but it is so fun to play with. Oh. And I can hear we just slammed into something else. I was trying to set it up a little bit. Um, oh, well. I, well, well, we we banged into two cars. It's fine. It's fine. 
Uh, anyway, uh, I was trying to set up a little air to slow down, but uh, as it turns out, this locomotive actually never had an independent, so I was wrong last time. It's not that it's supposed to have one, and it doesn't. It never got one, so um, uh, maybe someday we will have one, but we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, obviously we hit another car with a knuckle, uh, and then it just kind of punted it out the way, and then it banged into it, it, another car. These are the ACF box cars. We saw them last time. We know we know they play nice. Yes, of course. So why don't you just back up a little bit and make the hitch with the combos? Sure. Let's grab these guys, too. Try and be a little gentle with it here. Little blips of the throttle. That's all you need. It's a true steam chest sim. I'm still not used to that in a train game. All right, there we go. Got that. And uh, I think we've got everything hitched up here. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> From knuckle to Lincoln pin, back to knuckle, and then knuckle to knuckle. That's so cool. But now, do me a favor. Go set up the handbrake on that last box car. Okay. Let me climb up on top here, proper way. All right. Handbrake set. And now just give the engine a little throttle, pull away, and then uh, yoink on the cut lever. Okay, just a little throttle. A little, just a little, so it's yanking away. And then go yank on whichever cut lever is on this side, yeah. And now you can see... Only one open. Yeah. Only one open. Beautiful. Yeah. Just a, just now, a wee bit of throttle, yeah. Now, back up and try and make the hitch. We'll see if we get the uh, the bug that's not a bug, but is a bug, but is a feature, but is a bug. Bang. Oh, okay. We, we made the hitch that time. But now do the same thing, but open the other coupler instead. I didn't ask for an in-between, but I am the engineer, so. There we go. All right, pulling. And now try and make that hitch again. We'll see if it does the thing. Ah. Oh. It... It didn't make. What are these, Janies? So, something like that. So this is... Uh-oh. Oh, you broke a link. I, I was going to say, I heard I heard the naughty sound. Oh, and now, of course, I can't pull away. So, I guess we'll have to go hitch that up. Yes, link strength is a thing. Uh, and obviously, I was just kind of handling it like a, an idiot going back and forth as fast as I could. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what we were just looking at was uh, technically a bug, but it's a bug that acts like a feature. Because I'll wait for Mr. Locomotive to stop being angry. Got a lot of air brake sounds to make, man. Yeah. But it's a bug that acts like a feature because in real life, sometimes couplers just go to F you. Yeah, sometimes they don't want to mate. Uh, it depends on all kinds of little things. Sometimes they're yeah. they're fine. Sometimes not. If you're in a curve, if you have weird conditions, if the maintenance isn't great, um, you know, uh, definitely something to work on for gameplay's sake. But uh, you know, for the but for the true knuckle and we'll make the we'll make the joint for the true enthusiast. Uh, perhaps a very fun thing as well. So, <laughs> as we say, we're always working on uh, all the little things and all the little details here. So, more to come. Yeah. And uh, why don't you go ahead and look behind us and see the, the hilarity that Tristan has set up. You mean I didn't lay that? <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, well, I yeah. can only imagine what the... Uh, what Tristan, the Tristan made us a little... The hoop de doos are for. I don't know. Tom and Jerry, like, rug slip kind of deal with some track? Uh, yeah, we need uh, we need some... Woo! -woo 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 sound effects. Um, and the reason... The reason this is here is because there's another really cool feature about knuckle couplers that I want to show off. All right. Well, uh, I'm excited to see this. All right. Well, so let's, uh, I guess, uh, how fast do you want me to go for this? Ramming speed or just a casual, uh, you know? Just just inch over the top of the hill. Inch and over the top. Off, maybe go hang off the side of the, um, like, one of the boxcars. Look at that join between them. Ooh, almost bypassed there. Almost. Oh, oh, well, I guess we did bypass there. <laughs> Welcome to the hump. Um, it's automatic. It's fine. Oh, 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 oh. that's a time. That's a time. That's a time. 
yeah, it's it. We 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 actually lifted the the trucks off the rails and. Uh, and they did not come back on, but we did bypass the knuckle on the other one. Yeah, yeah so the, the links uh, were strong enough to withhold that because it wasn't so, so much of a shock force. It was constant. Uh, and so we picked up <laughs> the weight of, of the one truck off of each one and then uh, those one in the dirt. Uh, but uh, our one boxcar is going to roll to the next town, I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So that was where a lot of my time was spent, was all of these little things getting the knuckle couplers to be, like, even even closer to just right. I see, man, they I'm... still need more work in my eyes, but I'm still really pleased with how they've come about. No, the, the little details like that are really what make it fun, and I guess I'm going to have to streamline the transitions and uh, program my roller coasters with, uh, you know, some smooth curves. Because, uh, you know, you want to yeah, keep cause... that together. Or, or, just, yeah. or just die like men. I mean, you know, it's fine. It, uh, I mean... It's kind of cool because it does give Lincoln Pin like a, a slight advantage in some way. If you want to run really silly track, where oh, we're we're in 060. It's fine. <laughs> that that's somewhere else. Yeah, if you want to have uh, ES and D track work, you know maybe Lincoln Pin's your jam. <laughs> yeah, because uh, knuckles ain't aren't gonna be aren't gonna be having that. Well, Jake, thank you so much for sharing these cool updates to Knuckles and getting to see things in a little bit better detail as well uh, up close with uh, your feedback right here right now. But uh, up next, we've got a fun round robin talking about all things 818C, and uh, that's going to be really cool to see with Ben. So once again, thank you, Jake. Really appreciate this. Yeah, absolutely. Can't wait to show you all more. Now, we've all heard quite a lot about the infamous Eureka one of the Baldwin 818Cs that's made it into preservation and it comes out to operate every now and again. But Eureka worked for the Eureka and Palisade and what you may not know is that it had a sister named Palisade. And there are some fun, unique differences between these locomotives. And joining me to talk about these two 818Cs and, um, well, let's just say a lot more are several of my fellow developers, including Ben, who actually created this wonderful 3D model. Ben, tell us a little bit about the 818C. So the 818C is like, it's you. It's very similar to what you would expect from an engine like Glenbrook, an 820D. Uh, the boiler is actually identical in this case. Uh, it's the exact same drawing of boiler. Uh, but obviously, as you can see, it has larger and fewer driving wheels. And then uh, it's very much a passenger engine, not a freight engine. Uh, so it's designed to go faster. And well, it will. It doesn't like hills, though. I was going to say, depending on what it's pulling, <laughs> it is a, certainly a quick, speedy locomotive. But uh, yeah, not not a whole ton of tractive effort. But sometimes you're out here, out in the high plains, and you got lots of tangent track to play with. And, uh, you know, this kind of locomotive is going to be exactly what you need here. So tell us a little bit about what it was like making this model. These uh, All the variations and all of the fun that you went through to come up with them all. So this engine has been um, a lot of a lot of my time for a while now. I actually started this project before Century of Steam existed. Um, so I've been working on it for quite a while. I think it's been about four four years, something like that. Um, but really, I really got excited about the project when I saw uh, or when I got asked by some people if I wanted to maybe contribute the model of Century of Steam. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a, f a cool idea. Let's do that. Uh, and so we have many 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 options and variations that i've been working on, and i still have quite a few that i would like to add as well yeah um, that's uh that's one of the most exciting things we we showed off the 1024e made by daniel gallery in previous vlogs and we were kind of flabbergasted with how many combinations it was and in that video uh i asserted that it would be the most customizable engine and then dan said well i don't know maybe the 818c um and uh, yeah, that's uh, it's very <laughs> much the case here. So uh, let's grab a couple other ones to take a look at here and uh, chat about some of the fun variations. But hold on a minute. Before we move on, uh, I think it's important to discuss a lot of the differences between these two sister engines, Eureka and Palisade, although they are only one apart in roster number and only two apart in serial number from Baldwin as far as the 818Cs, with the Eureka being the seventh and Palisade being the ninth. 
the time between these from 1875 to 1876, a lot of changes were made in, at Baldwin in the 818C drawing for pattern. If you look at number four, the Eureka, it has a shorter cab with a round panel, as well as three section counterweights on the drivers. Whereas Palisade, they switched to a taller cab with a square panel and four section counterweights for a bit better balancing. Additionally, you might be wondering why the smoke box on Palisade looks so flat. And that's because the only photo we have of it is presumed either post wreck or post some other incident where the casting would have shattered um, because it's currently just more or less bolted up with a plain sheet of uh, flat uh, sheet metal, which is quite funny to look at. Um, but overall, like this is a major change in how Baldwin went about building this model. And it's one of their longest lasting models they had. I believe the 818C drawing for was offered for almost 30 years at the company. And as such, hundreds of railroads got these. You know, when we are sticklers and say, oh, it's not quote unquote a Eureka, you know, what? why we are insistent on the Baldwin uh, classification, the 818C drawing for, is because there were hundreds of locomotives built like this, not just Eureka, not just Eureka and its sister, but many railroads across the entire country. And to reduce it to just the name of one entry in that long lineup and that big family of engines really erases a lot of the history and a lot of the regional representation that these can give you. So we've created some templates of a lot of the engines that were built to this pattern and we'd like to show you just how versatile and how widespread this can be. It's wonderful that we still have Eureka and that it still operates. It is a gorgeous locomotive and great to go see. Uh, but absolutely, this locomotive is absolutely states wide. Um, and it's amazing that there are three that are still around. But uh, even then, <laughs> the customizations and all the different varieties that there were back in the day uh, deserve a good look and good praise. So let's go check out a couple more. Speaking of preserved 818Cs, this is one that I personally got to see just a couple weeks ago. The North Pacific Coast Sonoma, number 12, is preserved at the California State Railroad Museum. Uh, and you can already see a couple differences from the last two that we saw, although overall pretty similar looking in terms of customization. Uh, ben, what do you have to say? Uh, so this engine is in style one, uh, which is one of the many Baldwin styles that were kind of standardized throughout Baldwin's catalog. Um, in the early eight or mid to late 1870s, when these engines first started coming onto the scene, style one was very common for passenger engines. So that's why a lot of these 1875, 1876 engines, you'll see the liveries look very similar. Um, this engine is painted in one base color of the two that were most common, which are wine and lake. Um, one of the, the lake is a little bit brighter, or the wine is a little bit brighter, sorry. Um, but mostly they're similar. Uh, but you'll also notice on the front number plate, something that you people who have looked at Eureka before may have seen in other pictures, um, the white ring around the number plate. Um, Eureka and Palisade would likely not have had that when they were built. It was not something that Baldwin really did. Um, but Sonoma, being a North Pacific Coast engine, did have it because North Pacific Coast like to make their own little changes and paint pretty, uh, pretty things onto the number plates. Uh, so when Eureka was restored, they saw a picture of Sonoma and they were like, that looks cool. Uh, and so they slapped that onto Eureka as well. It's so interesting to see the little details that come out from the references you have, you know, maybe the pictures of Eureka historically weren't available at the time. Uh, she's been in preservation for a long time. So always interesting to see those little nuances and new things you learn as research unfolds. <laughs> and that's one of the neat things about this project for me is undoing a lot of the preconceived notions we have about this equipment and really learning what it was actually like. I mean, even with, um, you know, a lot of people recognize Eureka and Palisade number four with an eight and a half inch pump and with two injectors, but as built, it had no air brakes to speak of whatsoever and had two crosshead pumps just like Sonoma did. 
as well as an injector on the right hand side which is one of the few details you can tell obviously different from uh those in terms of mechanics uh, in terms of the two we just showed uh there's no injector over here and that's so. going to be something really neat about this engine specifically is there are so many different feed water pump and injector combinations that it will really help you as an engineer or as a fireman learning to run the locomotive and manage the water level you'll get to experiment with different systems like that and see what really works for you yeah it's going to be a lot of fun to get to know all these different systems for sure but uh, you've been hearing speaking of different systems the the thrum of a small air pump and uh over here another north pacific coast prototype um and of the, the setups we have for these different locomotives, this might be my favorite one. Um, it is just so classy. I don't have much to say about it, but it just it looks like it's dressed up in a little black and gold tuxedo. I love it. It's, it is adorable. Yes. So this is um, North Pacific Coast number 11. I believe it's pronounced Marin. Marin. Um, I'm not the best with uh, local place names sometimes. Um, but you'll notice immediately that this engine has lost a lot of its lining. This is a later period for the engine. Contrary to what a lot of people say, the black paint is more of a statement that says, look at me, I can pay people to keep my engines clean. Uh, but also a lot of the brighter colors and a lot of the striping uh, was starting to be considered gaudy by the general public. Uh, and so the engines got simpler. Although, as you can see, this engine has obviously still got some lining on the domes and it obviously still has lots of brass. Uh, but it also has a very pretty logo on the tender, which I love. Um, as for the air brakes, uh, we have a six inch air pump on this engine, which is what most 18Cs that would have been delivered with air brakes would have had. And what a lot of engines that were rebuilt with uh, air brakes would have gotten as well. Um, it's an earlier Westinghouse standard. Um, not a lot of six inch pumps made it very far because they were replaced with the eight and or the eight, the eight and a half, the nine inch pumps later on, uh, as more standards came into play. Uh, this engine, say. yeah, they didn't last all that long in terms of uh, being the standard. Uh, but a lot of 818Cs did get them. Um, uh, a lot of DNRG engines had them, which we'll, I'm sure, see later. Um, this engine does have the main reservoir on the tender, which was a very common thing for Baldwin to do. Um, it may look familiar to some people who are interested in specific railroads. Um, this engine, when it got air brakes, would have had the air tank underneath the cab, um, but there wasn't really a good way to do that on the model. Uh, maybe a future thing if I want to rebuild a whole bunch of stuff, but probably not. Uh, but, you know, this is a pretty good example for most Baldwin engines and not just one specific rebuild. Right. Uh, I also love the stack, the big the, giant Steven stack. The Steven it's, stack it's, is a mood. It is very indicative of sort of like, you know, 80, late 1880s uh, Central Pacific or Southern Pacific influence on the railroad. All right. Well, we've had our little taste of West Coast things, but uh, as we said, these locomotives ran all over the country. So let's talk a little bit about the East Coast. What's up with this one? So this is something that, you know, some people have asked us is, oh, are we ever going to do main narrow gauge? And the answer is yes, but it's not two foot. Um, in fact, a lot of people don't even know that Maine had three foot narrow gauge. Um, but this is Bucksport and Bangor number one, the Richard P. Buck. And this locomotive especially is indicative of a lot of the, you know, sort of storied multiple careered histories of railroads because um, shortly after it was built and ran in Maine, it then flew south for the winter and was sold to the Orange Belt Railway in Florida. And you can see it got an extended smoke box. It got quite a bit of changes. Um, apparently, they actually kept the gold leaf lining on the tender and then just painted the locomotive black, which is a, a neat thing. That is kind of wacky. Huh. But, as, but especially with Orange Belt Railway number seven, it gets more into sort of the look that people expect with East Coast locomotives. It has the extended smoke box with the clean outs and the chute. Um, you know, you get more of this sort of eastern style that people associate with that um, but there's another locomotive that is another example of east coast but also very historically significant for this class of locomotive and that is lancaster oxford and southern number six which is the last locomotive built to the 818c drawing four pattern 
this was the very last one of that drawing pattern. That's uh, that's kind of neat and very cool to see that we can represent it. And uh, it's a bit all over the place. You've got the smooth, modernized domes. It's got a three chime on it instead of in the single notes we've been seeing. It's got the extended smoke box again with the clean outs. And now we can see some class lamps. Um, cap stack, shortened pilot, knuckles, the whole nine yards, kind of as we saw in our last devlog there. Bigger air compressor mounted up high. Uh, yep. ni nice and easy to see right through uh, if you're the engineer. That's why you lean out. <laughs> and ben, ben, when was this built? 1905? These, uh, so Lancaster, Oxford, and Southern bought two engines, number five and six. Uh, they were built in 1905. Uh, there was a couple of more 818Cs, two different patterns that were built after this, up to, I think, about 1915. Uh, but they were, I believe, meter gauge. So not really applicable for our game. Right. Yeah, this would be 30 years after um, the Eureka and Palisade engines. So really one of the longest-lived patterns that baldwin did and in the way that you know the enp engines were all style one this is style 291 to give a sense of the amount of time that's passed it's kind of crazy you know, to it, think about but if it ain't broke you know don't fix it another interesting thing to point out about the style 291 on this engine is that even at this point with standardized liveries you can get things somewhat customized normal style 291 engines do not have tuscan wheels uh, but Lancaster, Oxford, and Southern was like, give me that, please. And Baldwin was like, <laughs> okay. So they have Tuscan wheels. Uh, the striping pattern is the same, but the base color is different. Most style 291 engines would have been either olive green or black with either gold or aluminum leaf lining. By this point, the wine and lake colors that we talked about earlier were not really an option anymore. <laughs> That's so neat. And you can also see it's burning coal at this point rather than uh, wood, as we've seen on the other ones. I guess all three of these are coal burners, though, mm -hmm. uh, versus the West Coast engines we saw, which were all burning wood in their early years. And a, a cool thing about these engines being coal burners is on the engine with uh, the engines with extended smoke boxes, they have the cleaning ports on the sides up near the top. Uh, these are something that's pretty essential for self-cleaning smoke boxes, which is mostly a way to just reduce effort of the crew. Uh, if you don't have a self-cleaning smoke box, you can have mountains and mountains and mountains of ash to pile out of the smoke box, okay. especially if your coal is bad. Is it number seven here and also number six off to the side have something that technically no 818C that I found has was ever actually fitted with. Um, they had very similar things, but not the same thing. These engines have ash ejectors. You can see them underneath the extended smoke box going out underneath uh, towards the pilot truck. Uh, so this was sort of a thing that got lost, I guess, kind of in the shuffle of advancing technology. So this was a way to make everything fully, completely automatic. So you have your self-cleaning smoke box, all the ash that doesn't get ejected that's too big goes into the bottom of the smoke box. And then you have this ejector in the bottom of the smoke box, which is literally just a steam jet, and it blasts it out the bottom of the smoke box. Um, a lot of roads decided relatively quickly that it was unnecessary. Uh, so a lot of engines have a hopper instead of a ejector, and the hopper is just the ejector, but it stops where the big wide piece is with the slot in it. It doesn't have the nozzle underneath. Right. That's uh, a neat and bit that's, of tech. Yeah. A lot of uh, engines that had ejectors had them removed later on uh, just because they were annoying to keep up with more than they actually helped clean out. Um, but I thought it would be cool to have something that you could put on your engine, even if it wasn't something necessarily that 818Cs actually had. Uh, Representative I of made... the era, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then I, I haven't made the hopper yet, but it's another thing to add. Like I said, there's always things I'm adding, so I've got some more variations coming. And because everyone loves everyone's favorite Colorado Railroad, the Denver and Rio Grande, uh, we've got three different DNRG variants right here. All very cool, kind of spanning from the early to the late. Tell me about them. DNRG was kind of a, a large buyer of this sort of engine, especially in uh, early on, relatively speaking. Uh, between the first few and the last few, uh, it was about a decade of time passed. Uh, and they also had some that were a slightly different design, but mostly the same. The only difference is the stroke is a little bit longer on the cylinder. Uh, so that's an 818 and a half C, which those are also represented here. Um, DNRG had 18 of these. 18818Cs. 
Um, but they also made some, you know, fun modifications to them. The two over here you see are on the left, uh, Rio Bravo and Rio Alto, are pretty typical of the period. As you move towards the right, uh, you see a rebuilt engine. Uh, it has had a brass steam dome wrapper added, which on a smooth dome is a bit strange, but DNRG was all about doing fun things on their own. They didn't follow um, their own standards, I'm they aware. They didn't. <laughs> uh, it's got the extended smoke box now. Uh, they have a different headlight. Well, I think they all have slightly different headlights. Um, but also you'll notice that the numbers range from 38 to 100. Uh, if that doesn't tell you the span of time that it goes over, then I don't know what else will. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. All right, well, let's take a look at one last set, and then we'll get into other topics for this month's devlog. And for our next set, um, you have me confused. Welcome to the Virginia and Truckee Railway. Um, <laughs> this headlight is not something any A18C ever had, but... I loved it because it was so quirky and strange. The Virginia and Truckee modified many of their 440s to have this sort of headlight bracket. The best I can find is that it was supposed to increase the distance the light was cast. Um, or maybe, you know, blinding cab forward crews in Reno. Also a possibility. <laughs> um, I just engine... can't get over the fact that it looks like my grandparents' coffee table. Like, literally, my grandparents had that as a coffee table. Mo modern Virginia and Truckee stuff is a vibe, and funnily enough, the V&T did have narrow gauge. Um, both the Carson and Tahoe Lumber and Fleming were Glenbrook ran, and the Carson in Colorado, which later became the SP narrow gauge. Um, so this was sort of a fun way to, uh, you know, pay homage to the V&T. Um, you know, it's very influential in a lot of our understanding of Baldwin styles and build practices. It's very influential to, you know, Nevada and California narrow gauge. So we thought we'd throw some of these in as uh, fun little Easter eggs, including the VNT headlight bracket and also the VNT passenger bell, as well as a couple of other things. The passenger bell is a fun thing. Uh, a lot of Baldwin engines that were earlier engines, uh, early 1870s and such, that were passenger engines got this style of bell. I couldn't find an 818C that had one, but I just had to do it. It's so pretty. And there's no guarantee that there wasn't one. It's one it of may those have been an engine we just don't have a picture of. You did they take a picture of every single one? Not in the early days, so, yeah. And we've so got air, uh, air, airified sand on this one, finally, and uh, again, a more modern air, air brake setup and all that fun, too. Yep, That's driver cool. brakes, larger pump. Yep, um, still a wood burner, though. <laughs> But it's not the only engine on the scene either. And it's we not. have. And you can hear the, the drum of the, of, the, of the oily, fiery. Yes. <laughs> I love so much how this is just we have the Reno at home. The the What I'm used to seeing on a K36, these giant train order boards on an 818C, um, it's very strange, but I'm here for it. <laughs> very much an SP standard thing. A lot of other roads also use them for like displaying the number of the engine sp like to use them to display the number of the service the train right. uh, so you could have like extra whatever or sometimes you'd have scheduled trains and so you'd have the train number and if there was a section there'd be a dash and another number behind it to indicate the section um a lot of uh sp subsidiary roads ended up with some of these engines so i decided why not have train indicator boards uh, we also have electric headlights. I was going to say, the this dynamo. is the, the first one that we've seen that's actually got an electric headlight on it. <laughs> Which I think is much fun. I love being able to give all these options. Uh, I wanted one with electric headlights just because, you know, being able to modernize your engine. A lot of these engines lasted quite a long time. They got rebuilt and rebuilt and rebuilt and modernized. And so you end up with engines with air brakes and electric lights and crazy things that they wouldn't have had when they were new. Or right. even oil burning equipment in this engine's a case. But speaking of oil burning equipment, we've got uh, the first engine we looked at. But as it looked for most of its life. So Eureka of the Eureka Palisade ended up being sold. Um, it got renumbered from four to five in the process. It was sold to the Sierra Nevada Wood and Lumber Company. Uh, and it was rebuilt kind of in stages over time. Um, this is what it would have looked like after its last rebuild. Um, so it's got the oil burner. It's got the very odd-looking Sierra Nevada Wood and Lumber Company stack, which yeah, the weird I bottom. Knew. Yeah, 
It's supposed to increase drafting, I believe. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a nozzle, but that's strange at the same time. Yeah, very strange. Uh, but this is what the engine looked like when, well, after it was rebuilt the last time, and when it was withdrawn as well. We have a picture of the engine being delivered to the scrapyard in this condition. So the kind of the bookend on the 818Cs, I guess. Yeah, from early Eureka to just number five, which that's kind of the story of the railroad to some extent. It started all pretty fancy, ridiculous, garish, uh, you know, many different words, and ended up being more utilitarian, and the numbers uh, took place in the names and, and all that. So being able to see that all the way across the history of this very diverse cast of uh, locomotives and their styling is really, really cool. Ben uh, and the rest of the team, thank you guys so much for joining me for this segment talking about the 818Cs. These locomotives oh, are gorgeous. How many? Wait. How many? How oh, many possible oh, 818Cs we, are there in yes, the history of Steam? Yes, how many? You did the math. Tom did the math. They did the math. They did the math. How many? I, I, I did the math wrong. Jay corrected the math. No, Tom did the math right. They just got the, uh, the big number word wrong. Uh, no, word, numbers are hard. So, yeah. so if you just counted mechanical details, not counting paint, not counting lettering of the class 56, a.k.a. the 1024E, that was 43.2 trillion unique combinations. Ben has since claimed the record for that now. This locomotive, this 818C, you can make, what is it, 11 and a half quintillion unique 818Cs with the tools it's, we provide. And I still have more just, to add. Yeah, it is and just an insane number. Bigger. Uh, that's just, I mean, literally not possible to parse in your head. Um, and that's not even including text and numbers and whistles and, uh, yeah, that's, um, yeah. that's a little insane. To wait. All Someone of the said, different liveries. <laughs> yeah. Someone said the 1024E was going to be the most customizable and Ben took that personally. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. But uh, thank you for the work, Ben, because uh, these are just of gorgeous course. locomotives. We love seeing all of these uh, different varieties, and you're really going to be able to do a ton of different things to these locomotives and personalize them for your railroad. So uh, yeah. thank you ben, so much. I can't for wait for the future videos as we show off more and more variants. I love to see what people <laughs> do with the engines, too, when the game is released. I yeah, can ben. only imagine. Well, thank you so much, guys. We've got more devlog to come, so... We're going to pivot on to another subject here. All right. Well, back to the scene of our winter storm here on Ponderosa. Uh, we've made it past where that poor little 818C couldn't get quite through the drift of snow using our fancy wedge plow here. But uh, we've heard rumor that there might be further drifts up the line, and uh, we wanted to go see what we could attack here. But I also wanted to show you guys one of the coolest things that we've been really excited to show off. We always talk about difficulty levels, different experience levels, learning controls, learning how to do things, all that sort of stuff. Well, one way that we're going to bring about accessibility and enjoyment is via a very DCC-style control setup here. You can see down in the bottom right corner when you press the key C, out slides the UI here. We have controls for our Johnson bar right here, controls for the throttle, control for the whistle. And that is a uh, Rock Island 5 chime, which sounds quite delightful. Kind of very unique sounding whistle. And uh, in this deep, deep canyon cut here on uh, Ponderosa, it sounds exquisite. We also have controls for the tender's handbrake, seeing as this locomotive is not equipped with an independent or an automatic brake. So we can't operate those things, but we can operate the handbrake here. We see our boiler pressure right now, and again, we've got firing turned off for the sake of our own sanity. A speed readout, and then options to turn on the headlight if equipped, which uh, our plow uh, makes it so we can't do that. Cylinder cock toggle, bell, and then as well, sand. We also have a button to consist other locomotives, and we can toggle between running, firing, and all those sorts of things. Uh, more to come, work in progress as always. But this is a really easy way to just operate the locomotive without needing to worry about it too much. All right, let's get this thing rolling here. A 
then press F, and then you can click on a locomotive or car to be attached to it. And you can enjoy a fly cam attached to the locomotive. Or if you press F and you click off the locomotive or anywhere else, you've just got a free fly cam and you can see what you might be able to see. Oh, like a, uh, a big drift of snow ahead. A really big drift of snow ahead. Looks like that slide ran pretty hard while we were gone. Go get him. <laughs> All right, not so bad through there. Everything. Come on. We need a little bit more speed. We got some ice in here. There we go. More speed, more power. Even with the wedge, one one little 10-24, 10, 10 it's a small little 280. We're gonna we're gonna have to get some uh, some backup here, I think. So um, you know uh, why don't uh, why don't we call down the canyon and see if uh, see if we can get any help from anyone else out there. Now watch closely on this one, ladies and gents. <laughs> so, uh, in our original whistle presentation, our very first patron devlog that we showed off to you guys, um, people noted that the echo sim did not truly do the right thing and it did not actually represent the speed of sound uh and well i knew that it didn't but uh i've rectified that so if you're far far away down the canyon let's see if we can grab our leader here number 194 you'll see that the uh, the plume of steam will come before the sound now All right, he's up on it, guys. Let's ease back on that. We don't need to be going too crazy here. Don't need to plow into our friend. We want to help him plow. We don't need to plow into him. <laughs> so let's see. Let's get these all put together here. Oh, yes. I still got another handbrake on. All right, we'll get them all knuckled in. And then we're gonna see what we can do about this drift with a pile of these engines here. <laughs> Good hitch, stretch them. All right, seems like a pretty good stretch. That, uh, that oil headlight glow sure is pretty nice and spectacular through the snow here, but uh, we don't really need it, so we'll turn that off. And uh, what I'm going to do next is uh, one of the things we're working on here is the easy ease of use of this sort of thing, where we do have a consist button. So you can grab any of the locomotives, and I'm going to kick off all the brakes. Syncing the controls is one of the details we're working on, but if you consist and all the controls are in the same spot... You can get all three of them to do what they're going to do as well. So we'll sit here and uh, we'll announce ramming speed. <laughs> if I can stay put on this not very level track here. <laughs> it's uphill and it's a snowdrift. All right, kick those brakes off, kick those brakes off, consisted, here we go. All right, guys, cut on in. Come 
Well, that, uh, that was less than spectacular. We only have a little bit before the track's washed out. Come on! And this, ladies and gentlemen, is how you ruin a frame of a steam locomotive. <laughs> oh, they're trying. They're trying. They're trying hard. Come on. Railroading in the winter is not for the faint of heart. But it sure does make for a good, fun show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to keep working on plowing this out here, little by little, bit by bit, and I'm going to keep praying for a, uh, a rotary snowplow to arrive, because uh, a, a drift that's, you know, up to the top of your boiler barrel isn't as high as they go, but it's uh, certainly not easy. Anyways, guys, we hope you enjoyed a little round robin presentation featuring all things with a newly revitalized locomotive in our 818C, a better look at more of the fun features going on and things in Ponderosa, all sorts of fun knuckle coupler things, and uh, a look at some true snow fighting <laughs> on a very, very grand scale. Anyways, guys, thanks so much for watching. Thank you so much for your love and support. We will catch you all next time. I heard you talking smack. I heard you talking smack. <laughs>